Hey, sports history fans, this is Ariel Gonzalez from Wrestling With Heels On. Hey, when you go to a sporting event, you don't go there to be meek and mild unless you live in Japan. You go there to get freaking wild. That means bringing some attitude to your amplitude. How do you do that? You get racket. R-A-K-I-T. Racket combines a compact 7-inch megaphone, eight powerful adjustable LED lights, noisemakers, an insert you design, and it's all fully customizable to match your team's colors. Now, here's the coolest thing about this product. J.J. Abraham, the founder, was the ultimate cheer dad. He followed his daughter's cheer group around the country, and he saw parents struggling using all sorts of crazy contraptions to make some noise for their kids. And then he had an aha moment. He thought, wait, why not combine all of these doodads into an all-in-one compact device for the ultimate fan? J.J. and his team were three years on developing version after version after version until they finally landed on Racket, R-A-K-I-T, so you can make some noise and cheer and be a part of the action. So get out there and let's get loud. Bring a Racket to your next game or competition to cheer on your favorite team or athlete. You can customize your Racket with your own logos, drawings, and names. Get beads to match your team's colors. Flashing lights add to the excitement. Are you ready to make a racket? Be part of the game. Each racket pack comes with one racket megaphone, one lanyard to keep a hold of the thing, two scratch-resistant bead packs, one clear and one color of your choice, and a 10-pack of customizable self-adhesive inserts. Currently on sale, wait for it, $24.99. To pick up your racket today, head to MyRacket.com. That's my r a k i t dot com. Now get out there and make some noise. Is us? This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Hello sports fans and welcome back to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast where we discuss the best of sports from back in the day. I'm your host Dana August and I'm grateful to have you on once again taking time out of your busy day to give us a listen. And just a reminder don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you hear us. In this episode we're going to be highlighting the American Football League, the so-called foolish club that took on the NFL and made itself into one of sports greatest success stories. Talking to us today is author Erin Grayson Sapp and her new book, Moving the Chains, the civil rights protest that saved the Saints and transformed New Orleans. In her book, she writes about the 1965 AFL All-Star Game in New Orleans, which had to be moved at the last minute to Houston because of a player boycott, which was caused by racial incidents that happened in the week leading up to the game. Later in the show, we'll be sending out a melancholy shout out to the late great John Hadel, who passed away at the age of 82. And of course, we will have our usual home field apparel top five. Since we are paying tribute to the American Football League, we're going to be counting down the five greatest moments in AFL history. So we have a lot going on in this episode, so just sit back, pump up the volume, and enjoy. You are strolling through the sports memory lane via the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. At the Sports History Network, we're all about the sports yesteryear, and so we're pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings sports history to life. The Row One gallery features over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, and advertisements in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. Any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. 
It's your choice. In the Row 1 shop, you can pick from thousands of unique items that feature retro and historical backgrounds dating back to 1876. We have everything from clothing to phone cases to mugs, even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com backslash row one for access to the full row one catalog. When you buy from the gallery today, you can instantly save 15% on your purchase. All you have to do is enter the code SHN15 and your discount will be applied. That's SHN15. That's it. Simple. Save 15% off all your prints in the Row 1 Gallery. Just go to sportshistorynetwork.com backslash row1. And don't forget to check out all the podcasts on the Sports History Network. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. And we're back here on Historically Speaking Sports. I am your host, Dana Augusta. And today we have a very special guest. Now, throughout every now and then in sports, you would see where social consciousness and sports kind of go intertwined with each other. And in this particular case, this is where it happened. Um, Recently, you saw in the last couple of few, last few years, I should say, you know, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee doing the national anthem is one example of protests and sports colliding. Another one was in 1968 with Tommy Smith and John Carlos still in the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City, you know, with the black glove hand, fist raised doing the national anthem. But this particular incident where we're talking to talking about today took place actually three and a half years prior to Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And that was the protest during the 1965 American Football League All-Star Game, which took place in New Orleans. And that is our subject here today with our special guest, author Aaron Grayson Sapp, who has written a book called Moving the Chains, the civil rights protest that saved the saints and transformed New Orleans. Aaron, great to have you on board. So great to be here with you, Dana. All right, so let's talk a little bit before we get into the actual events that took place, which are very interesting, in fact, and I think it's one of the one of the most under told stories throughout all of American sports. Let's talk about, you know, you as for example. Um tell us about yourself and your background and what inspired you to write this book. Well, I describe myself sometimes as an accidental author because I don't think I ever thought that I wanted to write a book. I just stumbled upon a story that we're talking about today and I couldn't believe I'd never heard it before. And the more I looked into it, the more important it seemed and the more I just felt I I really needed to try to get the story out there. So uh, I actually came up uh, across the story in grad school when I was working on a completely different subject for my dissertation, which was already underway. And I just fell in love with this story and had to put it kind of on the back burner until I could uh, finish my degree. And then I was lucky enough, as soon as I graduated, to get a position as a scholar in residence at the historic New Orleans collection. And they just have amazing archives, things like the Sugar Bowl records and uh, papers of David Dixon, who was considered the father of the, the New Orleans Saints. And it just gave me an opportunity to do the research I needed to do to flesh out the entire story and and get it in book form. So that's just how I, I sort of accidentally came to be the person who wrote this book. Now, have been an accidental author. I like that. I like that that title that you give yourself. I think that's pretty cool and pretty interesting. Um, but what we're talking about is the is this All Star game that took place in New Orleans in January of 1965 at Tulane Stadium in the between the Eastern Conference All Stars of the American Football League against the Western Conference All Stars of that league, and there was a lot of interesting facts and interesting things that took place during that time and you know obviously you had to talk to a lot of different people to put this book together who are some of the interesting who are some of the people that you had to talk to and you got information from in writing this book well i did a few interviews myself um and until we get deeper into the story it'll sound weird but a couple of old georgia tech uh players, football players, who participated in the first integrated Sugar Bowl. Um, I was lucky enough to interview a few of those guys. Um, I 
interviewed the legendary Norman Francis. Uh, if you know anything about New Orleans culture, um, oh, yes. you know, just quite a figure. I feel so honored to have had that morning with him. Um, and he, he actually ended up being one of the first uh, black owners in the NFL when the Saints uh, you know, were awarded to the city and he became part of the minority ownership. Um, so he had, a, and he also was so involved in the civil rights movement in New Orleans. He just had such a, a treasure of information for me. It was really amazing. Uh, and I, but I was also lucky enough to um, come into contact with uh, other people's interviews, pe people that had interviewed um, some of the old AFL all stars that you were just, you know, talking about that were involved in the walkout um, in New Orleans and. Um, some of the old figures in bringing the saints to New Orleans, um, like David Dixon, like I mentioned. So it was a wide variety of, of voices that ended up playing into pulling the story together. Now, we, let's go back to a little bit of a background on what was taking place during that time. It was, like I said, 1965. This was during the the height of the AFL NFL kind of war and war for viewership and everything when you had two different football leagues that would play every Sunday. Um, it was the fourth, like I said, the fourth annual all-star game in New Orleans. And you said, and you, the aforementioned David Dixon was very instrumental in bringing that game to New Orleans and for reasons for trying to get a, an exp either an expansion team or a previous or a, a current team to New Orleans, whether it's the NFL or, NFL or AFL. Um, what were some of the things that they, that, that, that David Dixon was trying to do as far as like, uh, bringing the team, bringing the, the game to New Orleans? Well, David Dixon worked for a long time on bringing a, a team to New Orleans. He actually started his efforts in 1959, hoping he would get in on the first AFL season. Um, didn't, that didn't happen, of course. And, um, after that, he and there were other other uh, promoters in town, but he certainly was the main force. Um, they brought in a lot of exhibition games in the AFL and the NFL to try to prove the fan base, and they did. They the, um, New Orleans fans set attendance records at these games, um, and you know these were sort of auditions, and they were passing with flying colors. And uh, on, the, on at least that front, of course, they were running into some. Uh, issues with segregation that were just sort of piecemeal being chipped away at and um, things were coming together but very, very slowly and uh, this would have been this AFL uh, all-star game would have been the biggest audition for the city and as you said David Dixon brought that in thinking this is this will be our final audition the uh, AFL owners meeting was going to be held in New Orleans that week too expansion was on the agenda for discussion during that meeting and local fans thought, Hey, we've, we've set records for what were basically preseason tryout games. We can fill a stadium for, for a tilt with nothing but all stars. You know, we fill two lane stadium by the end of the week, we'll probably have a team. Uh, and this was just sort of the outlook that they'd done well. And this was going to be their, their big audition. Um, and it's interesting. You mentioned that the AFL and the NFL were sort of in competition at this time. Over the period of time that New Orleans was trying to get a team, uh, it had sort of started to shift between cities battling with each other to get a team in either league to the leagues sort of starting to feel they were in competition for the top cities that they would be judging and picking, particularly Atlanta and New Orleans. Uh, by this time, people were starting to think, you know, planting a, a flag in the Southeast would be a big deal, a big win for either league it was a virgin territory at that time and so it it sort of started to shift what the competition was and by January 1965 people were thinking this race is picking up and we wonder who's going to win who's going to get their first flag in the southeast and, and also doing the doing that time you know mid-1960s you had the civil rights the, the um the Civil Rights Act that was just passed about, about right around six months before that. So, you know, things were changing in the South at, at, at the very rapid pace, you know, as far as like segregation and that sort of thing. Um, and then you had a few, maybe a couple of weeks before the actual game, you had the Sugar Bowl between 
LSU and Syracuse, and you had their two. Syracuse had two main stars, and they were black, which was Jim Nance and Floyd Little. Incidentally, both of them would be AFL future AFL all stars. Um, but that was like one of the first. You know, you had the first integrated game in in I think 1956 in the Sugar Bowl, but this one was with a, a team from up north once again with two black stars, and then heading into that game and. The, in the build-up doing before the Sugar Bowl, there was very little racial incidents that were taking place from what I've read about. Did you hear anything similar to that? Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, what I, I don't want to oversimplify it. It's, it's kind of easy to do, but um, um, I think it's fair to say that New Orleans didn't have a lot of pushback uh, uh, in that time period against, like, as you say, the Civil Rights Act, which was I, it was funny, it, the All-Star Game was announced within a day or two of the Civil Rights Act being passed, that it was going to be held in New Orleans. And you should say it was just about six months later. So um, what I what I uncovered was that New Orleans, it, you know, it has a reputation for just being sort of slow moving, unexcitable, kind of lazy and proud of it, just this sort of permissive, tolerant place. Mm -hmm. And that's its reputation. That's, you know, it preserves its heritage and traditions and um, which is what makes it the tourist attraction it is. And so it's just, um, I, what I found was that New Orleans just was kind of sticking with the status quo. There wasn't a lot of um, pushback against the Civil Rights Act, for example, but there also wasn't a lot of like, hey, let's become super progressive and change really fast. That's just not, uh, it doesn't fit with New Orleans' branding, this uh, you know, idea of rapid change and progress and advertising itself as a place of, of change and progress. Um, so what I found was that, spe especially after the Civil Rights pa Act passed, um, New Orleans handled it very, very calmly. There wasn't a lot of violence and, and, and protest and a lot of, of strong pushback. So New Orleans also just was sort of patting itself on the back, being lulled into complacency, feeling like we're doing all right. Our status quo is, is fine. They don't, I mean, insiders and um, outsiders had long thought of New Orleans as a little head of the rest of the South in racial matters. And so I think once a lot of state laws were wiped out and things just kind of got back to the status quo of, say, 1956, New Orleans was thinking, oh, we're, we're still doing we're still doing all right. And I love that uh, there's a quote from one of the AFL All-Stars after the walkout um, who said, Larry Guerin, I believe, said um, that he felt like New Orleans had a false sense of full integration. I really think that that was incredibly accurate that um that's where new orleans was just sort of in this place that we, there wasn't a lot of as i said not a lot of strong pushback i'm not saying there weren't pockets of uh, racism and segregationism but new orleans i felt i feel like was sort of its own its own beast of just uh just being stagnant right and needing a wake-up call to realize we're not really doing as well as we think we are in this stagnation we've actually missed out on a lot of progress and we have a long way to go. And I think that that walkout, the, the wake up call is exactly what they needed. Okay. Now going, okay. Now the, you, the sugar bowl takes place, very little pushback. New Orleans is almost like it within its own kind of cocoon, you know, with, you know, being, you know, its own city, which in a lot of cases, that's just the way it is. Like you said, then the all-stars start arriving in New Orleans what were some of the events that happened that made the, the, the players say, okay, something's not right here? Well, well um, actually, it's, it's interesting the, um, to, to, to talk about the Syracuse players real quick. Um, there, it wasn't that there weren't any problems with, uh, with the Sugar Bowl. It, it did go off as a fantastic success in the mainstream media. Um, a lot of that is because the Sugar Bowl organizers were really uh, in tune. They were really careful. They were super careful to make sure that the players had very busy schedules and, and knew where to go and where not to go. And they were aware that things weren't perfect because they'd been trying for a while to push forward integration and progress in a lot of ways and had, you know, they were, they were a force in that way. So they, they kind of knew better what was going on and they were very careful. Still, of course, the players did Sort of some of the black players did go out on their own and they ran into some trouble getting taxis or trying to get into establishments um, in, say, the French Quarter. 
uh, but this got very little press. And, and as you said, the Sugar Bowl came off as a, as a big success. Uh, um, Dave Dixon, on the other hand, um, you know, the force we were just talking about behind bringing a pro team to New Orleans, he was much more of a wide-eyed optimist and um, a very good-hearted man, but also very naive when it came to what the reality was uh, on the ground. So when he organized the All-Star Game, he didn't put in all these safety measures that the Sugar Bowl men had. He just thought when people arrive in New Orleans, they're going to love it as much as I do. We're a great city. We're a great football city. Things are going to go fantastic. Fantastically, he didn't arrange for transportation from the airport. He didn't double check the way, the way organizers in other cities like Atlanta had in the past. They had double checked with hotels and restaurants to make sure that everyone was going to do what they needed to do and knew who was coming in. And I mean, it, it was it was very interesting, the contrast there, because like I said, um, Dave Dixon just just sort of assumed things were as great as they needed to be. And um, as you said, when, when the players started arriving, it didn't take long at all. One player almost turned around and got back on an airplane and didn't even leave the airport. It did not take long at all for incidents to to startle these men. Um, you know, they thought they were arriving to, um, you know, radio stations and advertisements had been pumping up all these, these you know, football heroes are coming to town and all, you know, this is going to be some big Hollywood type treatment. And as soon as they, they arrive in New Orleans, they... Um, some were even insulted in the airport um, when they get outside the airport to try to get a taxi. Some are waiting hours to get taxi cabs. Um, as I said, you know, some didn't even <laughs> want to make it to the hotel. When they did, they uh, some weren't allowed to even eat in the restaurant inside the hotel that their their reservations were. Um, and it just went on from there. I mean, they tried to go out uh, if they could get somewhere in a taxi. Um, they were turned away from nightclubs, uh, one case at gunpoint. Um, it was, and it continued even the next morning um, with things like that, people trying to eat breakfast and, and being insulted and told not to hang their coat on next to their another person's coat on the rack at the restaurant because they didn't want their coats to touch. And just a wide range. Of, um, another one was being uh, told not to use the main elevator in the hotel that they were staying in um, to use a side elevator. Just just a wide range of of, um, of abuses, and it didn't. It took less than twenty four hours for the guys to get together and and take a vote and say, you know, we we can't play. Expected be expected to play be one hundred percent on the field and be treated less than out, off the field outside the stadium. And they, you know, took a vote and decided to walk out. Yeah, one of the stories that you said uh, was was Ernie Ladd. You know, I had the great privilege of getting to to, to have gotten to know Ernie Ladd. You know, not too long before he passed away, um, he had told me this story. And first of all, you know, when he was going to this one particular club in the French Quarter, and he got turned away at gunpoint. Um, and what's funny about it? It's not funny, obviously, but. If you don't, if you haven't, if those of you who have never seen Ernie Ladd in person, Ernie Ladd is probably the largest human being I have ever laid eyes on. Even even in this advanced age, when I when I first got to know him, he was still massive, and he was still had this presence about him. And I think whenever I hear that story and I think of him, I think of that scene in in the movie Blazing Saddles when. The you know Alex Karras comes into town riding an ox, and the sheriff goes out to, with a gun, and, and Gene Wilder says, "Don't shoot him because all you do is because if you shoot him, you just make him mad, you know." And that's when I think of when I think of Ernie Ladd in that situation. But during that time, I mean, you've heard a lot of stories. I heard his other story with with Cookie Gilchrist. You know, Cookie was waiting for a taxi. Cookie Gilchrist, all pro you know, one of the legendary running backs of the AFL for the Buffalo Bills, he was standing there waiting for a taxi. And he says, you know, and some guy said, we have to call y'all a colored cab. He said, I don't care what color it is. I just need a taxi to get to the hotel, you know? And, and that's, I mean, it was, and, and the AFL, and you have to also think that the AFL was one of these, was a very progressive league, and, you know, with, they had more black players in that league than the NFL kind of wanted to have at that time. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, the the AFL is remembered for being uh, much better about hi hiring black 
players and, and uh, staff members, as you say, and advancing race in sports in that way. But one thing I, I feel like I, I uncovered, um, I've become convinced that they had a, a, a very complicated relationship with, with the racial situation because the, if you think about it, the head, the two head men, the architects of the league were Texans. Yes. And they were certainly pro integration, but I think they had, they had more faith in the, in the, the process taking place and just working itself out because they had seen the growing pains of the civil rights movement in their own cities in Dallas and Houston while they were forming their league. Um, you know, Bud Adams had to lobby for a fully integrated stadium when he uh, you know, first fielded his team. And I think, and things did progress and work out. And by the time we're talking about tech, Texas was doing fine with its uh, pro football teams, but, um, but I think they just, had a little bit more faith in things working out and they were willing to, because Dave Dixon faced problems bringing in exhibition games, as I mentioned briefly before. Um, and they, they, the AFL still came back to him and said, oh, let's try another game. And I don't think it's that they didn't care. I don't think it's that this wasn't a priority. I just, I feel like um, that just gave them a little more patience. And by 1965, Pete Rosell had started telling certain uh, exhibition cities we're not coming back to you if you can't guarantee some things you haven't guaranteed until now. So while they weren't, while the NFL wasn't being as as progressive with employment, if you put it that way, I think they were starting to just have less patience and be a little more uh, strict about things. And I think the AFL was a little more likely to take things slow and trust that they were gonna work out rather than just sort of writing people off um, as quickly. Okay, now all of this, all of this racial, you know, incidents that took place in New Orleans, it, it happened. The players were very upset. The black players were very upset. So they decided to have a meeting, okay, to to address their grievances about New Orleans. Who were some of those? Some of the players that led in the protest. That's interesting because you mentioned Cookie Gilchrist, and he. I think a lot of people who know the story think of him as an, an instigator of the walkout and from what i found uh, he was known as an instigator um his reputation was very much yeah, was, by yeah, that, that, that's what he was yeah. known for yes exactly. <laughs> exactly he was very very opinionated yeah. to say the least <laughs> absolutely it just as luck would have it if you want to call it that um he had a fine time in new orleans until the morning after Everyone had gone through all these things. We were just talking about Ernie Lag getting turned away at gunpoint, all that stuff. He had a wonderful time. He didn't have any trouble getting any taxis. In one case, because he was with Jack Kemp. And if you were with a white associate, it was okay for you to get in a, in a white cab driver's taxi. Right. Um, and he had gone to a um, an African-American nightclub and had a wonderful time and had no trouble getting a ride back. He had no idea that any of the guys had gone through any of this. So he actually sort of, you know, came late to that party in that sense. The, the decision had already been uh, made to walk out by the time someone called him up and told him. And he's he's shocked. He's thinking, "Wait, we can't leave. This is this is too big. What's going on?" And when he first started to hear about it, which was which was very interesting because when I first came across the story, I ran into people talking about how much of an instigator he was and how he had had a <clears throat> a leading role in it. Really, it was um, people like Ernie Ladd, uh, Ernie Warlick, Dave Grayson. Um, Earl Faison, uh, Clem Daniels, uh, and I know I'm leaving off very important names. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I know one. I know. I know. What well, one story that came out of the meeting was Abner Haynes, the running back. I think he was with the with the uh, Broncos at the time, and he was talking about walking out. And he's like, "Don't let me go home." And then I turn on the TV, and y'all guys are playing. You know, <laughs> yes. you know, that's one of the funny stories that come out of it, uh, that they, they, they came out of that. But, uh, yeah, I, I know Amner Haynes was one of the players that was also part of that. Um, yes, and and that running was back from the Raiders was one. But you also believe that you also had some white players that were that were part of this protest as well. They were talking about walking out as well. Yes. Um, so. The white players, the black players met at, at the Roosevelt Hotel for their initial meeting, voted to walk out um, without the white players. The white players 
or at least one of the teams, the West squad, I think, was on a bus outside the hotel about to go for their practice at Tulane Stadium. And, um, you know, none of the black men are on the bus because they're all at their meeting. And uh, the first white player to interact with them was Ron Mix. He walked to the front of the bus, asked the coach if he could go talk to the guys. And uh, he went up there and, and had a long conversation with them. And they all listened. And um, he was just sort of putting forth the idea that maybe it's more of a statement if we stay. Maybe walking out isn't the way to address this. Maybe we, um, we can stay and we can protest even stronger by being here and being vocal while we're here. And the guys listened to him. Some were getting a little angry, I think, but they finally just started telling him that their stories and say, this is much more than you realize. And one story after another, after another, after another. And he just realized, okay, I'm not going to sway them. I'm still not sure this is the best decision, but if they're going, I'm going with them. And I want at least one white player to go with them. And so I'm on board. But the fantastic thing was after the vote, they ended up taking a second vote. But after um, after the final vote, it was sure they were leaving. They did. They did not leave so fast. They didn't meet up with their white teammates. And one after another, you know, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, just, uh, just one after another said, if you're going, we're going with you. And I did not come across a single example of a white player who was grumbling or in disagreement with them. And actually, um, the, when the uh, Players Association was supposed to give some sort of presentation to the owners meeting, and the game, of course, gets canceled in New Orleans and moved to Houston. So they still hold this meeting. And the representatives that went from the Players Association, they were expected to, to give a um, kind of an angry, divisive complaint about, for example, um, rookie salaries, um, things like Joe Namath's contract, the divisiveness in the locker room of, of um, the pay discrepancies. But after the walkout, their, their presentation was we've, something like, we've come to a new understanding of the relations of men. And it was all about unity and and togetherness and uniting as a team. And it was it was just beautiful. I I, I haven't come across any stories of of there being uh, any disagreement from their white teammates. Yeah, that's that, that's interesting, especially from that time. You know, because it was, you know, it, it was uh, contracts and and salaries back then was nowhere near like it would like it is now. Obviously, and a lot of these players would get a bonus for playing in the All Star game. You know, and, you know, and, and it, it wasn't like, like I said, the major contracts back then, but they would, you know, these players, you know, were so united with their black counterparts, you know, that they were, they were like, okay, we agree with you and that sort of thing. It was a difficult situation for the AFL because, okay, it would be, you know, they walk out, you know, you know, it, it was, if they walk out, we have to move the game someplace else, you know. So they, so the AFL was faced with a very difficult decision to make: either to play the game in New Orleans or move it someplace else at the last minute. Yeah, it was it was not an easy thing to do, and it didn't it didn't work out well, um, you know, on the bottom line way of looking at it because um, it was so last minute. Um, and the AFL did openly support the players. Uh, there was a rumor that in the beginning they were going to see if they could just field the white players. I don't even know if that's true, but that's what some of the papers were saying. And of course, it, it didn't take long for the white players to say there's no game happening in New Orleans. It has to be. Um, it, well, there is no game being played in New Orleans. And then the league had the decision, do we just make it a strike? Is this game just getting canceled? And they realized that was terrible PR. They, were, they couldn't have the game go down as a strike. So then they had to move it somewhere. Offers started coming in from all over the place, Atlanta, Miami. Um, but the AFL thinks, OK, we've made enough of we're taking enough risks with non-league cities and hey houston's not that far away right. <laughs> they're a league city they're right here so let's just put everything uh in the mail to to houston and it came together fast but um and successfully but the the stadium was mostly empty they didn't bring in much of a crowd you know did they didn't have the the motivation that new orleans did that new orleans was planning on bringing in sixty thousand people uh and i think they brought in like fifteen thousand maybe in houston um so it was it was successful uh, in the yeah, as a relocation and as a, a rebuke of New Orleans and all of that. But as far as a game, it wasn't a very good game. It was it was very lopsided competition wise, and as I said, the attendance figures were were pretty low. 
Yeah, you know, you know, just speaking of the game, the West defeated the East thirty-eight to fourteen. Um, the East was coached by, you know, the, the the two coaches that faced off against each other in the championship game, which was the Bills and Chargers. You know, the Bills coach was Lou Saban. The Chargers coach was Sid Gilman. Sid Gilman coached the West. Lou Saban coached the East. Willie Brown was the defensive MVP from the Broncos, and Chargers running back Keith Lincoln was the offensive MVP in that game. So the game moves out of New Orleans, okay, at the last minute. It's obviously a financial hit to New Orleans because they were expecting 60, 65,000 at Tulane Stadium. That never materialized. So ultimately, how did it affect pro football being, you know, or the, 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 two foot, the, two, the, the two leagues, I should say, looking at New Orleans as a viable spot for putting a pro football team in that city? Well, uh, let me just say real quick about what you said about, about Willie Brown. Um, I love his story. He, he was so happy that the game was moved to Houston because he had been cut by Houston um, his rookie year after being signed. And he understood that he had been cut because they didn't have an even number of black players and they wanted players to room, black players to room with other black players. And he just, he wanted to have the best game of his career because he had taken a stand for civil rights. It had moved him into Houston. He was back in Houston as an all-star and he said he wanted to have the best game of his life and as you say he was defensive MVP so I thought that was a very cool little anecdote that came out of that but to answer your question about how the leagues looked at um at New Orleans after that I mean both the AFL definitely took a huge step back they knew they they couldn't talk about considering New Orleans uh, as an expansion site um they just for for PR reasons, they needed to really step back, even though a lot of them felt bad for Dave Dixon. You know, he was a good guy. He very naive, but a very good guy um, had worked so hard. A lot of them had befriended him. Um, so it was an, a complicated situation. But like I said, I said, from the PR standpoint, they had to take a step back. The NFL sort of looked into the situation and thought perhaps there was some wrong on both sides. Um, you know, they didn't approve of what the players had gone through, but they wondered, you know, was the was the walkout the answer? And they thought, well, you know, it's not our business. We've had success in New Orleans. So they didn't take quite as big of a step back from the city as the AFL did. And they, they held, for example, a, another exhibition game in, in town that, that next summer. Um, but, and I'm sure you know this, the uh, it sure helped the NFL's relationship with New Orleans that when the AFL and the NFL decided to merge, and needed some heavy antitrust legislation greased through Congress. Louisiana had two very powerful congressmen at the time who found the right loopholes to get that legislation through for Pete Rozelle. And uh, that was a real boost to the relationship between New Orleans and the NFL, to say the least. Well, it, you know, doing the entire history of the AFL, just, you know, doing research, the AFL was seriously put, wanted to put a team in New Orleans, even going back to the early 60s, because the Raiders were having problems in Oakland after their first year. In fact, they were practically bankrupt. And there was rumors floating around that after their first year, during the, during the Raiders' first year in 1960, that they were considering moving to New Orleans or Seattle um, after their first season because they were just not making any money in Oakland. In fact, they weren't even playing in Oakland. They were playing in San Francisco at the time. But by the time of the AFL All-Star game, you also had the Broncos, who was in in financial trouble and they were also the AFL possibly figuring out ways of trying to move the Broncos to New Orleans as well. But when all of that happened, they decided to, okay, the two, we, we got some expansion cities that were looking at ultimately they would move to Miami they would put teams in Miami and Cincinnati, you know, by the end of the 1960s. And of course the saints, and of course the saints came around in 1967, they were founded in, November 1st, 1966, which was 18 months roughly after, you know, after the, the walkout in, the, in, in New Orleans. But um, that was one of the things that it, it kind of caused the black guy from New Orleans from the AFL standpoint, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting um, how close New Orleans came to getting a team before the walkout on several occasions, you know, in 1963, I believe, was when Oakland was seriously considering moving out. And rumors had it that, that Dixon came very close to bring the Raiders to New Orleans. Uh, same with the uh, 
with the Texans. Um, you know, at this, as the story goes, Dave Dixon was just one meeting away, one signature from the Tulane board away from getting uh, the Kansas, what is now the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, the uh, the Dallas Texans in, in Tulane Stadium. Uh, and so it, it's it's very interesting how smitten the AFL was with with New Orleans in the early 60s. But if you look at the, uh, you know, the attendance numbers and and their desire to be the first league in, to, in the Southeast, it, it makes it does make sense. But uh, it's looking back, it's, it's strange to imagine like a New Orleans Raiders team. <laughs> yeah, it, it that, that does sound that does sound kind of weird. And trying to put trying to imagine that that is kind of weird. It really made my dad happy. My dad's a big Raider fan, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately it also affected. You know, you so New Orleans should would have been the first team in the Southeast, but it, as it turned out, the first team in the quote unquote Southeast because we don't necessarily consider Miami Southeast, but is Atlanta. You know, Atlanta was the first team in the Southeast to get a pro football team, which obviously became the Falcons, which came about one, a, a year before the Saint, before the Saints came around. Uh, I'm surprised that, you know, the, and you said earlier that the AFL was also interested in Atlanta as well. They wanted to have a, at least be the first league to plant a stake in the Southeast. Absolutely. The, the leagues were really battling over Atlanta. Um, it, it's a great little it was a great story to to include in the book that just how close the AFL got. I mean, they had signed a contract with a, um, a businessman in Atlanta who called the mayor and said, this is so great. I got us an AFL team. I'm coming to your house. I've got the contract. We're in the AFL. And the mayor says to him, have you talked to the stadium authority? And the guy's like, what? I, Atlanta needs a team. I've got us a team. What's the problem? And the problem was people had flown in that morning to talk to the stadium committee and try to put an NFL team in Atlanta. And so at the last minute, there was an actual battle happening. And um, with the NFL's bigger popularity, the mayor knew, I can't just hurry up and sign off on the AFL team. I'll be run out of town. I know my city really would rather be in the NFL. Uh, so things kind of got put on hold until Roselle could find the ideal buyer and everything fell, uh, fell into place for the NFL. And um, so the AFL is playing catch up thinking, okay, we, we lost our first choice. Uh, they thought they could um, have a deal to put an AFL team in Philadelphia. That fell through for political reasons. And as you say, uh, I want, sadly, Miami was sort of like a number three choice in that way. But um, even though Dave Dixon gets on an airplane and flies to meet with Lamar Hunt, thinking, okay, maybe New Orleans can be a swell consolation prize since they lost out on Atlanta, but it was too soon. As you say, it was right after the walkout and uh, right. too soon to entertain that idea. So uh, Miami had what they needed and, and, and got the nod instead. Aaron, it was such of a great interview with you and such a great time talking to you and talking about this, this, this major, this walkout, you know, is there any other projects that, that you as an accidental writer uh, are working on right now oh i, I have a, a a seed planted of a of a football history that would take me back to world war ii but the sad thing is records are so scarce uh from that time period for so many different reasons that i'm not sure it's gonna ever be able to get fleshed out but um i'll keep you posted Right, right now, I should say my big project is getting these AFL guys some credit because I think, as there's, we've said, their story is undertold. I think they made a big difference. They really were a wake-up call for New Orleans, and um, I, I really hope that the story can get out there enough to maybe get these guys a, a pat on the back that they've deserved for a long, long time. All right. And uh, before you go, going back to this, I would be remiss to ask – is there one story that you did researching this that you just found absolutely unbelievable and amazing? Wow, there were so many. There really were. Um, I, I really think the most amazing part of the story was um, at the end of the book, after the, the, uh, the city gets the Saints, um, the way the team comes together, people were so skeptical because of the the quick pro quo with Congress and Pete Rozelle that I mentioned earlier that New yeah. Orleans has a team. Had they really changed since the AFL walked out or, or things just, you know, just New Orleans had some shady politics and they got their team, even though they haven't 
done what they need to do. The way the team came together was just beautiful. I mean, integrated from top to bottom, from ownership to cheerleading squad. Um, the original owner um, received a Pioneer Award from an Atlanta group of, of sportsmen that was originally um, designed for Branch Rickey. I mean, it, the, the team just came together in this beautiful, united way. And I think it's because of the All-Stars. I think this, in order for the team to even exist, they had to be a united, uniting factor. And I think that never changed. I think the city rallied together to prove that they deserved a team. I think when the, the team came to be, that's exactly what it was. And um, I was surprised by how many examples I found after the Saints came to town of, um, of unity and progress and integration. Um, I think it's the legacy of the walkout. And it was, it was really mind blowing, just the, the amount of impact it had. Well, let me introduce you one more, one last time. This is Aaron Grayson Sapp. She is the um, the author of Moving the Change, the Civil Rights Protest that Saved the Saints and Transformed New Orleans. Aaron, it was so great to talk to you today, and uh, it was it, learning about this 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 very, and I think that is very undertold story of of pro football, especially pro football in the South. Thank you. It's been so great talking to you too yeah I, I appreciate you let, letting me get the story out i think these guys did an amazing thing and it was just so much fun talking to you about it thank you so much for joining us and we'll be right back right after this with every race every qualifying run and every pit stop tim Coffeen would feel the pressure and excitement with his own podcast on the sports history network called tim Coffeen talks indy car and racing history Tim will share those very same racing emotions and memories with his listeners. Learn, laugh, and enjoy the world of IndyCar racing through the eyes of Tim Coffeen. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello and welcome back to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast where we focus on the best of sports from back in the day. And just to remind everyone out there, you could follow us on Twitter at HistoricallySP2 to get your daily dose of sports history. And in addition to that, you could also drop us a line or two at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. And right now it is time for the Home Field Apparel Top 5. Home Field Apparel is the sponsor of our weekly top five, where we count down the five biggest historic moments in the world of sports that are celebrating anniversaries and is being brought to you by Home Field Apparel. The college football bowl season is set to begin, and the best way to show off your school spirit and your fandom is to wear a shirt or hoodie from Home Field Apparel. They have a wide range of styles for your favorite team with what I call old school logos and pictures, not, to, not only to make you stand out in the crowd, but also show that you are a true fan. They have shirts that represent close to 200 schools and adding more and more each day. And on the website, you can hit the rewards button located at the bottom of the screen to get 20% off of your next purchase. So give Home Field Apparel a try as you watch your team's bowl game. That's Home Field Apparel, where they study your school's history, traditions, and legacies to create thoughtful premium apparel, a must-have for your next tailgate. So, once again, Home Field Apparel, where they're fond of saying, wear one for the team. And this week's countdown will highlight the American Football League, and more specifically, the five greatest moments in that league's 10-year run. you got to remember, the league lasted from 1960 to the 1969 regular season and ultimately ending with the final whistle and the final gun of Super Bowl IV. So without further delay, here's the home field apparel top five greatest moments in the history of the American Football League. Number five. The Chargers destroyed the Patriots in the 1963 AFL Championship game. On January 5, 1964, the San Diego Chargers, champions of the Western Division of the American Football League, took on the title holders of the Eastern Division, the Boston Patriots. The game was the signature matchup between the Chargers' potent offense, led by Tobin Rote and receiver Lance Allworth, and the Patriots' stingy defense, led by Larry Eisenhower and future Hall of Fame linebacker Nick Bonacani. As it turned out, it was the play of the Chargers running back, Heath Lincoln, that told the story of this game. The game turned out to be a showpiece of Sid Gilman's offensive theories, as the Chargers steamrolled the Patriots 51-10 in the Chargers' first and only league championship. It was the Chargers' starting fullback and MVP, 
Keith Lincoln, that was the difference, rushing for 206 yards on only 13 carries and added 123 yards receiving in the title game at Balboa Stadium in San Diego. Number four, the Heidi game. On November 17, 1968, the New York Jets traveled to the Oakland Coliseum to face the Raiders in a game that would certainly have postseason implications. As it turned out, it became the most infamous and famous AFL regular season game in league history. The game was a high-scoring seesaw affair that seen the Jets lead, led by Joe Namath, take a 33-29 lead late in the fourth quarter. And as the Raiders started on their final drive of regulation, NBC decided to preempt the game and return to regularly scheduled programming. That night on NBC this was the Sunday night movie Heidi, the story of the little Swiss orphan mountain girl. The sudden switch left millions of television viewers unaware of what happened in Oakland. Only the fans at the stadium and listening to local radio were able to see and hear the conclusion. So on television, Heidi's story began. As Heidi was taken to go live with her grandfather in the mountains, no one saw Raider running back Charlie Smith take a Daryl LaMonica pass 43 yards for the Gorehead score. On the ensuing kickoff, Jets returner Earl Christie fumbled, a ra fumbled and the ra and Raider special teams member Preston Ridelhuber recovered in the end zone for their second touchdown in the span of 8 seconds. The Raiders claimed the 43-32 win and perhaps the most fantastic finish never seen. Number 3, Super Bowl 4. On January 11, 1970, the great and improbable run of the American Football League came to a triumphant end in New Orleans in Super Bowl 4. The Kansas City Chiefs of the American Football League took on the Minnesota Vikings of the powerful NFL. The game was legendary in a couple of ways. First, it was the climax of a league that was looked upon as a minor league in the beginning but achieved legitimacy in this final game. The second aspect of the game was simply Hank Stram. The film highlights of the game became legendary and cultural lore because of the NFL films decided to place a microphone on Coach Stram and follow him, follow him during the game. His banter has become an integral part of football lore. His call, 65 toss power trap on the Chiefs first half touchdown has been almost as memorable as the game itself. The Chiefs upset of the Vikings 23-7 gave the American Football League its second Super Bowl victory and avenging its loss three years earlier to the Packers. And it was also fitting that the man who started the AFL, Lamar Hunt, will be holding the Super Bowl trophy and his team, the Chiefs, winning the final game in which an AFL team competed. Number 2. The Texans outlast the Oilers in double overtime. On December 23, 1962, the Houston Oilers and Dallas Texans would meet up in the third American Football League title game live on ABC. Houston, led by quarterback George Blanda, was eyeing his third consecutive league title. Yet standing in their way were the Dallas Texans, led by coach Hank Stram and a young quarterback named, named Lynn Dawson. In, a, in rainy and windy conditions at Jefferson Stadium in Houston, the Texans got out in front fairly quickly thanks to defense that frustrated Oiler quarterback George Blanda and the Oiler offense and the Oiler offense trailed 17 to nothing at halftime. In the second half, the Oilers made an adjustment and got back into the game with the running of Oiler fullback Charlie Tolar. Late in the fourth quarter, Blanda found tight end Willard Duvall for the game tying touchdown and forced sudden death overtime. On the coin flip, Texans running back Abner Haynes was responsible for calling the toss. Hayes was instructed with 40 mile per hour wins to have the ball to have the ball at his back. However, when had the wind at his back, I should say. However, when Hayes made his choice and said, We'll kick to the clock, his words, we'll kick, meant that Dallas had made his choice. The Oilers would receive the ball to start overtime with the wind at his back. The Texans' defense would rise up and hold the Oilers scoreless in the first overtime period. In the second, with the Texans moving with the wind, drove down the field. Finally, with 2 minutes and 36 seconds into the second overtime, Dallas kicker Tommy Brooker kicks a 25-yard field goal to give the Texans their first American Football League championship 
and deny the Oilers their third straight AFL championship. And the number one moment in the history of the American Football League, Super Bowl III. The New York Jets shocked the Baltimore Colts 16-7 in one of the biggest upsets in sports history. On January the 12th, 1969, the Miami Orange Bowl will be the site of Super Bowl III between the Baltimore Colts, champions of the National Football League, taking on the New York Jets who had defeated the Raiders in, in, in the AFL title game two weeks earlier. The Colts entered the game as 18-point favorites on the strength of their 34-0 trouncing of the Cleveland Browns in the NFL Championship game. Jets quarterback Joe Namath added to the pregame hype during the week leading up to the game when he said that, quote, not only do I think we will win the game, I'll guarantee it. The Jets started out hot as the Jets scored on Matt Snell's four-yard touchdown run in the second quarter. While the Jets were holding their own against the Colts, Baltimore struggled. Their defense, led by coordinator Buddy Ryan, intercepted Earl Morrow three times in the first half. Who was in, Morrow was actually in the game subbing for uh, John Unitas, who had a sore arm, but Morrow led the Colts to the championship game on the strength of his league MVP performance that regular season. The Jets went into the halftime with a 10-0 lead. And in the second half, the Jets would add two more Jim Turner field goals to give them a 16-0 lead. Baltimore coach head coach Don Shula decided he had seen enough of Morrow and decided to insert Unitas, sore arm or not. With his sore throwing arm, he led the coach to a late touchdown, but all it did was avoid a shutout. It was too little, too late as the Jets claimed the AFL's first ever Super Bowl win, beating the Colts 16-7 and the biggest upset in Super Bowl history and one of the biggest in sports history. By far, the AFL's greatest moment. And that will do it for this week's edition of the Home Field Apparel Top 5. And coming up next is this week's shout out. And we're going to be sending a shout out to a former NFL quarterback that passed away last week. Now this quarterback from the University of Kansas is not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yet, has more passing yards than Hall of Famers Sonny Jurgensen, Joe Namath, and George Blanda. And his story is coming up right after this. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. And we are back, sports fans, and we're going to close out this episode of the Historically Speaking Sports podcast with a segment that we call The Shoutout. This episode, we're going to be sending a melancholy shout out to the late, great John Hadel. As a young kid watching NFL films, I remember seeing a quarterback that wore the number 21, throwing deep bombs to Lance Allworth as a member of my favorite team, the Chargers. And I thought it was kind of odd for a quarterback to be wearing the number 21. Yet to me, what that is what gave the Chargers its charm and is what made Hadel unique. If you think of images of Hadel doing his playing days, you would notice that he really didn't look like a quarterback, at least in the traditional sense. He was shorter than what a quarterback ideally should be, and is also sort of stocky. Hall of Fame offensive tackle Ron Mick said of his teammate when he first met Hadel that he thought that he was one of the new equipment guys. To me, he sort of looked like, a, looked like an out-of-work Hollywood stuntman but he could throw a pass as accurately at 50 yards as he could at 10 yards, and his favorite target was Lance Allworth. Hadel to Allworth was AFL's most dangerous and most potent passing combination. Hadel was the trigger man of, the, of 
Sid Gilman's revolutionary passing attack that, that he unveiled with the Chargers during the 1960s. Hader was born in Lawrence, Kansas on February the 15th, 1940 and attended the University of Kansas where he came on as a running back and a, def and a defensive back for the Jayhawks. He actually was an All-American at running back his junior season before he was switched to quarterback where he won his second All-American selection his senior year. In his final two years with the Jayhawks, Kans KU went 15-5-2 and, and led Kansas to their first ever bowl win, a 33-7 win over Rice in the Blue Bonnet Bowl in Houston. He joined the Chargers in 1962 and only found himself on the depth chart behind quarterbacks Jack Kemp and Tobin Rowe. And after his first season, Kemp was traded to Buffalo and Hato became San Diego's backup, coming in for Rote in mostly mop-up duty. Hato's first pro pass incidentally was a touchdown pass, a 15-yard completion to Bobby Jackson in the back of the end zone and a 30-21 loss to the Broncos in Denver. In Hato's first season, the Chargers went 4-10, but the Chargers turned it around in 1963. They went from worst to first as San Diego demolished the Patriots 51-10 in the championship game. Hato came in for Rote and actually went 7-4-11 for 132 yards with a passing touchdown and a rushing touchdown in that game. Hato would play in three straight title games with the Chargers in 1963, 64, and 65. And he would quarterback the Chargers into their entry into the NFL after the merger in 1970. In 71, Hader would lead the league in passing, becoming the first quarterback since Hall of Famer Otto Graham to lead two different leagues in passing. In addition to leading the NFL in 71, he also led the league in passing in the American Football League two other times, 1965 and again in 1968. By the end of the 72 season, Hader had been traded to the Los Angeles Rams and would lead them to the playoffs with a record of 12-2 in 1973. However, his success would not last in Los Angeles. Even though the Rams had a winning record, Rams coach Chuck Knox decided to go with the younger James Harris at quarterback and place Hadle on the trading block. In the middle of the 74 season, he was traded to Green Bay, in which historians consider one of the worst trades that involved the starting quarterback in league history. While the Packers got Hadle, the Rams in return got draft picks that would go on to be the nucleus of the Rams teams that dominated the NFC West and eventually play in Super Bowl XIV. Meanwhile, Hader would play the remainder of that season with the Packers and all of the 1975 season, which saw him throw just six touchdown passes with 21 interceptions behind a very shaky offensive line. He spent his last two seasons in the NFL with the Houston Oilers behind, backup, behind starting quarterback Dan Pastorini. He started six games while in Houston and tossing just seven touchdown passes with 11 picks. Despite his tenure with the Packers and Oilers, Hadle still finished his career with a record of 82, 76, and 9. Hadle ranks 40th all-time in wins and has more career wins than Sonny Jurgensen, Joe Namath, and George Blanda. After his playing career ended, he went into coaching for a short time, being the quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator at the University of Kansas. In the early 80s, he would, later, he would also coach in the USFL with the Los Angeles Express and the Houston Gamblers. John Hader was one of the quarterbacks that comes to mind when you think of the Chargers as well as the American Football League. He's one of the greatest quarterbacks in pro football history that is not in the Hall of Fame. And that would do it for this edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. And I would like to thank... Erin Grayson Sapp for coming on and talk about her book. Once again, it's called Moving the Chains and the Civil Rights Protest that Saved the Saints and Transformed New Orleans. And thank you guys for listening. And as a reminder, one more time, just not to forget to subscribe to this podcast when you, so you can get new episodes when they're released. And you can also check us out on Twitter at HistoricallySP2 where you can get your daily dose of sports history, and you can also drop us a line at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. And until next time, sports fans, I'll talk to all of you very soon. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, saying so long.
Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows... Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, Fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.